So yep. thank you all for tuning in. Uh, we are uh, TTC Games, and uh, Jeffrey and I are going to sit and have a chat every now and then and put up a vlog uh, on our YouTube channel. Um, if you like what you're seeing, please like, subscribe, and comment on, the, on it below. Our company website's in the links, and you'll find out some of the things that we do for a living, ranging from making some phenomenal board games to programming software, which is all conflict sim based. My background is I'm the system designer and I'm the MD of the company. Um, I work with military professionals and historians such as Jeffrey himself, who has a, a long track record of looking at World War One in particular, especially the U-boat project, which is a government-run thing, looking at the U-boat operations in World War One. So, thank you very much for coming on board tonight. What we're going to do is we're going to have a quick look at the loss of the Slava class cruiser Mosfa. We're going to explain a little bit more about one or two of our games and we're also going to take a look at the Ukrainian conflict and try and compare it a little bit with what went on during World War II, which is actually fascinating because it appears an awful lot of what's going on now is quite similar to what went on then. So Jeffrey, tell us a wee bit about yourself and, and, and rattle on about the, 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 the various ships that we've got to, to talk about here. Right, thank you very much. Um, I've, as John says, I was involved with the UPRO project for the Royal Commission for Ancient and Historical Monuments, Wales, where we looked at the, generally looked at the wrecks in the Irish Sea that were sunk during the First World War. So it wasn't just the U-boats, but it was also the uh, British escorts fighting the U-boats and the merchant tonnage that also was sunk. And as part of that, I began to gain an, an understanding of how the German Navy tried to prosecute a commerce war um, in the early 20th century. And having looked at that, I then, once we finished that, eventually I found myself getting in contact with John here and expanding my knowledge of the naval war of World War I from the commerce war all the way up to the utilization of capital ships on both sides, the utilization of naval intelligence to find and prosecute any more enemy forces, especially at the Battle of Jutland 1916. And ultimately, hopefully, with my research, I hope to expand my view to include other conflicts, uh, Second World War, maybe 19th century conflicts, and generally to just gain a greater understanding of the generalities of how naval power are used across any century and in any locale. Fabulous. So, a little bit of history about the Moskva. She's a Slava class missile cruiser. She was designed in the late 1960s and into the early 1970s. She was laid down in 1976. So, I think that might make her a little bit older than yourself, Jeffrey, and only six years younger than me, which is kind of pushing it a bit. Launched in 79 and commissioned in 1982 into what then would have been the Red Navy. Our missile systems essentially are SEN-6 and SEN-4 anti-aircraft systems and the S-300 or P-1000, if you like, uh, Vulcan anti-ship missiles. Now, let's try and get a very brief overview of what these things are. The S-300, the SEN-6 Grumble, is a long-range missile system which does not have a, a low-level shoot-down capability. So that means if you engage a ship with the right type of sea skimming missiles, you have a very good chance of evading engagement from our primary air defence system. The OZA SAM, which is SEN-4, is meant to be a point defence missile system, but apparently it can take up to 26 seconds to commence engagement. So if you don't have a lot of warning, there's a good chance it's not going to work. And the other thing is the probability of kill, even with two missiles fired, according to Wiki and various other sources I've looked up, is about 65%. It's only about 35% a missile. So at least a third of the time, you're going to hit the ship. For that reason, they actually have a close-in weapon system. They've got four of them, two forward and two midships in the ship. And again, they don't have 360 degree coverage and it appears they are not as good as the American version of this uh, with their Vulcan cannon. It just isn't as good, uh, nor is it as good as the one which I, I think we bought and put on our destroyers after the catastrophes in the Falklands campaign, uh, where Royal Navy ships with similar limitations were hit and sunk. 
or badly damaged by Exocet cruise missiles being fired fairly close in, but outside the primary missile envelope. So it's possible that she was engaged and hit by the two small Neptune missiles. Now, they say small, but they are about a 400 pound warhead, plus whatever fuel still on board. They'd probably make a bit of a mess of a lightly armoured ship. Modern cruisers are really just big ships. They are, are, are mission oriented names. Unlike a World War II or a World War I armoured cruiser or heavy cruiser, which may have some armour plate, potentially proof against anything up to eight inch rounds inbound, these things essentially have normal steel plate in the sides. They are not designed to take a big hit. Equally, the P-1000 Vulcan system, it's got an 800 kilometre range of a nuclear warhead, somewhat less with high explosive, but it weighs 6.3 tonnes, much of which is high explosive. In other words, it's a fuel, and it's actually the bit that goes bang when you hit the target. Now, these are old missiles. The P-1000 is up to 20 year old. The P-500, which was its predecessor, actually predates the design. It's a 1960 design that was dusted off repeatedly and finally perfected and put in these ships and various other things. <clears throat> now, as the Americans have found with their, their own missiles, and as I believe we found with our older Harpoon missiles in our fleet in the Royal Navy, missiles develop fatigue cracking. Things go wrong and they have a shelf life. So when you start to look at pictures of, of the Ukraine, uh, claim that the thing was actually sunk by them, we've got probably the best picture, I believe this is from CNN, and I'm not sure if you'll see this in the video directly, but we'll certainly put it into the video when we edit this. You'll see what is absolutely a Mosfet class cruiser, a Slava class cruiser. You can tell from the slanted missile launchers at the front, the big dome radar aft, the helicopter landing pad, and the VLS system for the air defense missiles here at midships. And you can see that she's burned quite badly. She's still smoking heavily. Now, anybody who sat and watched film of World War II, and see what happens when kamikazes hit ships, or American dive bombers hit carriers at midway, will know that fire in ships is a really bad combination. The ship may not sink, but it's highly likely to be burnt out and essentially not be usable, either indefinitely or for an extended period of time in a dockyard. Now, the picture of the MOSFET she was sinking here clearly shows there's still what may well be fires at midships. And the key thing is most of the damage seems to be focused around the bridge area and the area beneath it. Now, the area beneath it is where these great big uh, P-1000 missile systems that are. Now, we've already mentioned the Americans with a lot more money to spend possibly had a problem with these. My postulation is, did they hit it with missiles? The Ukrainians possibly. Would that have sunk it? Probably not. Is it possible either sympathetic detonation or more likely just a system malfunction caused a hot run in one of these missile tubes and it gutted the interior of the ship. I actually think that is just as likely and probably more so that a force that doesn't necessarily have the electronic warfare capability to engage even a 1970s or 80s vintage ship, which according to sources on the line, that if you go and dig yourselves, guys, you'll find out she was refit to some extent in the 2000s. That said, it's a 40 year old ship, which probably wasn't very well maintained. We just have to think about the film of the Kuznetsov steaming through the English Channel, essentially with a tug in attendance in case you broke down to get an idea just how well maintained Russian naval ships are. Jeff, what, 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 what is it that, that you've picked up from these pictures that we've seen? If you hover your mouse over the fire and then Get it on the grey area and then slowly go backwards, draw back bit by bit. Now, those three red dots, I presume, are naturally the interior. Um, so the uh, other side of the it's quite a thick, um, not a fence, the lining of the ship. I presume yep. that is not damage. I'm not too worried about that. But if you go back further to uh, keep going and stop and that, that red area now, is that rust? Or is that, I'm wondering, 
has the fire <coughs> out of that hole there and scorch that. Is that an indication of interior burning? I think it could be. The other possibility is that missile penetration point. Exactly. That light bit right here. Now, sorry about the image quality, guys. This is we're, we're not using our own cameras to take this, this these pictures. This is off the internet. And you can see that there is definitely some kind of damage here. Now, along the ship, if you look at nice pictures off in peacetime, you'll notice their portholes. These run along the upper deck. So for crew accommodation or officer accommodation or messing or whatever, a bit like a cruise ship, they've got windows, they're called portholes. That is probably what has burnt out through here, is the fires come along the ship from this area here that I'm circling and gutted this area. And if this is a missile hit, there seems to be quite a lot of smoke blackening in that area as a whole. So it's entirely possible she was hit here by a cruise missile, which, by the way, given that the point defence cannon are quite literally in this area uh, here, that is within the firing arc. It kind of tells you just how rubbish they actually are. And our SEN4 launcher should be somewhere in this area of the ship. It is aft. That's a short-range point defence missile. So that radar relates to it. It doesn't appear that she even reacted much to the damage or the potential of a missile attack. Now, I've seen blogs and I've heard people talking online and making commentary that, hmm, they used a drone to distract the ship. Now, my understanding of these Turkish drones, the Barakar drones, is they are semi-stealthy or fully stealthy. They would be designed, presumably, to defeat exactly the kind of radars that this ship would have had mounted on her. Why would you use something that is essentially invisible or extremely low visibility to distract your target? I do wonder if maybe psychologically that would make sense in that the Russians, if some, if a drone that is high visibility is off that cruiser, then the Russians will go, well, obviously this piddly little thing is trying to get our attention. But if it's a stealthy drone, that's difficult to pick up. So might the Russians think, well, this is going to be difficult to get rid of. <laughs> Yeah, in that interest to get rid of it. Yeah, indeed. But if you're going to engage it, what are you going to shoot at it with if your targeting systems don't see it and the thing's high enough for it visually not to be obvious? Yeah. Um, if you consider that the Americans got 20 odd dauntless dive bombers right over the middle of Kido Batai at the Battle of Midway without being detected, True. <laughs> admittedly, the Japanese didn't have radar and there was cloud in the area. But if you take a look at the sky here, well, you know what? Visibility is probably not brilliant, but it's not terrible. Yeah. You know? And for that drone to be audible in the ship, one might imagine it would be at that cloud level or just beneath it. Mm. So looking at her, I don't think she even reacted. I honestly think she was probably just sailing along, got the order, well, go, and, go and fire some rockets at something interesting inside Ukraine. Mm. And the guy hits the button and something goes wrong. But it's just my view on it. It seems to make a lot of sense to me. Yeah. I get the argument that actually, wow, that ship was sunk. It was hit by missiles. Maybe she was as well. It might mm. just be a huge chunk of bad luck. But given each one of the rockets that she had she had on board, these big cruise missiles are essentially five tons of high explosive. Mm. Then goes bang. To be fair, there is actually a case to be made there should be a very large hole in this area that I'm circling here in front of those three lights that you commented upon, which I'm wondering if that's still a, a burning fire there. Um, it's hard to yeah. say. That said, you know, if if the Ukrainians did manage to shove a couple of missiles there, I was about to say torpedo, which obviously they didn't do, well done. You know, it's an impressive operation. Um, that said, you know, I think, have you any comments on crew training, Jeffrey, for example? Uh, well, not really, no. I've heard very little about the state of Russian crew training. It's hmm. knowing what I know about the Kursk, there were some serious problems. 
Though the worst of officers that tried very, very hard to save that submarine. Um, really, it's just been over the past few days, well, past few days, the past 60 days, with, in, in certain places, there really has been video ev evidence of how execrable the Russian army has been performing in certain places. The, the, the training just hasn't been yep. good enough. The commander has been in the front tank. I've seen footage of convoys taking a very long time to react to being ambushed. It's, I would not be surprised if the state of the Russian Navy was, was similar. Yeah, um, I, I read somewhere that the bulk of the Russian military are still conscript. Yeah. And on, the army have, I think it's a two year enlistment. So essentially it's six months worth of training and then 18 months, you know, painting things which don't move and saluting things that move and then go home. Um, and these guys are now having to fight a war, which is never a good way to earn your keep especially mm -hmm. if you haven't been trained professionally. You should maybe compare that with the British Army or the US Army, where the training's at least a year before you put into a combat unit. And that training difference, it makes a really big deal. Now, in the Navy, I believe it is a year, and it's a three-year enlistment for a crew member with a professional officer corps. One of the things though, to remember, though, is it doesn't matter how good your basic manpower is, if you're non-commissioned officers, so the petty officers on a ship, I believe the Russians still call them Starshini, um, the sergeants in, in your army and the equivalent in your air force, and it depends on the air force. Um, if these guys aren't long service experts who've got maybe a decade's experience and probably know more about the operation of the ship or the weapon system that they're using, the tank or the missile launcher and ground and the aircraft in the air or whatever than the designers do, you have a massive disadvantage in terms of your combat effectiveness. Just a thought, again, probably open to a lot of interpretation. And actually your comments about the, the ground campaign, I think I think we'll get rid of Mosfa and we'll, we'll bring up something else here which is quite intriguing. Now, this map that I'm showing you is from the British Defence Intelligence Agency. And we've picked this one out of all the hundreds of maps because actually we thought this was quite clear. And when we start to compare it with World War II, it should be noted that the start line is from over here, just around Luhansk and down through Donetsk and to just east of Mariupol. OK, that was the area which they annexed because, hey, guess what, guys? These people are ours and obviously coming out the Crimea. Now, the initial thrust seemed to have been a helicopter landing just where this explosion is, just to the north and west of Kiev. Um, you'll notice, by the way, I'll always say Kiev, and I'm almost certain Jeffrey and other people will say Kiev. The reason for that is I work in Soviet terminology, and at that time it was Kiev. Sorry, guys, if you don't like it. <coughs> Excuse me. They also launched various thrusts through Konotop here and Romney and Sumy. Now, I understand from Ukrainian press releases, which have not been confirmed from Russia, and that's an issue we're going to touch on is information here, that this whole area is either contested or has been retaken by the Ukrainians and the thrust down through the Chernobyl zone here has essentially been withdrawn. Now, big chunks of that were shot up. We know that. There's film of that. There's big chunks of film of chaotic scenes in Russian units. There's claims, some of them substantiated by Russian press releases, that Brigadier generals, lieutenant generals, major generals, in other words, guys commanding fairly big chunks of the Russian army have been killed. Now, in the West, a lot of commentators have said, well, you know, these guys shouldn't be down the front. There's a chap called Heinz Guderian who developed German Blitzkrieg armoured tactics, and he insisted on colonels being in the front line and generals visiting it repeatedly. And the reason for that was the general's experience would drive the troops in a better way if he understood what the holdup or the problems were. 
I have a slightly different hypothesis, and one of the people I want to try and bring into these things is my head researchers, ex-US Army, is retired now. And he and I had a long chat about this, and 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 um, Colonel Manka basically said to me that he thought there's maybe too much of it going on, but he felt that I maybe had a case in point whereby the generals were going down to find out why their orders were not succeeding with a good plan. So the plan was to advance here to Kiev, political coup de main, if you like, and everywhere else was a series of double envelopments around Kharkiv and in through Luhansk towards Kramatorsk and Izium and up through Vol Volnikova towards the Dnipro. Yeah, the reality of it is, guys, that bit of the operation seems to be working fairly well. Everywhere else, though, as we can see, it does appear, according to the British government at least, to be a bit of a rickets. However, there was a pause with this column stuck in the middle of nowhere all the way down towards Kiev for about a week. What I think happened is some general drove down that road, took a look at it, said this is an absolute catastrophe. Nothing has gone right. So what we really need to do here, guys, is reassess, pull the manpower out, get people out of the radiation zone. Not every vehicle they were using there was overpressured, so the you know the guys would have to be suited up or whatever if it, or at risk. It's a failure. Why reinforce failure? That's not the strategy of the Red Army after 1943. And bear in mind, the Red Army is the Russian Army, and it is the Ukrainian Army, it is the Belarusian Army, it is the Georgian Army. All these guys are playing the same set of rules, if you like. They understand the same way of making war. They've got the same equipment and they've got the same overall doctrinal concepts of a war is felt. Fought. So the Ukrainians will have known that a Russian general who's under a lot of political pressure from Moscow, from Vlad the Impaler or whatever you want to call Mr. Putin, <coughs> essentially they're getting told, get a move on. They're going to go down the front. They're going to find out what's wrong. The other guys should be aware of that. They should have snipers. They should have artillery teams waiting for the opportunity to take these people on. The other thing that we haven't been told about is where most of these guys died. We know that one gentleman, I believe he's a commander for 49th Army, was run over by a tank. And I've seen some quite amusing memes and so on and claims on the internet that, oh, the driver reversed over him willfully. I know that during the Second World War, one of the toughest things that anybody could do was have infantry cooperate with armour. And nowadays you have radar, radios and all that kind of stuff. The Russians, they're not using the latest and greatest that they have. They're using certainly Cold War equipment, T-62s, T-64, T-64s uh, and T-72 tanks. They may not have that ability to chat on the radio so what they will have, though, is a World War II invention. That is a field telephone in the back of the tank. And the guy will be talking to the driver. And, and if someone starts shooting at the driver and he forgets there's some idiot behind him, he's just going to reverse over him. He won't care. <laughs> I don't want shot at. I think it was just an accident. Right? <laughs> and you're laughing, Jeffrey. You're meant to laugh at that. Um, it's sad. It's a terrible tragedy for the guy's family. But then again, there's plenty of tragedies going on here just now. Now, the obvious strategy for the Russians should have been to snip out this part here. Mm -hmm. And then swing round that way through Mariupol and up out of here. And you can see they are now doing it. And yes, these blue lines here in the map show counterattacks at Kharkov and counterattacks from Mikolaev into the sort of western edge of the Donbass. But frankly, to me, the Ukrainians have married the terrain in here and they're playing into the one big hand the Russian army does have. And that is it can line up all the way around here, hubcap to hubcap, three rows of artillery pieces and just keep on lobbing shells. That is the traditional way the Red Army fought it is how they did it in World War II. They weren't too bothered about accuracy, they just pummeled an entire area into the ground and whether we like it or not this this special military operation is a war it's being fought by people who are trained to kill people and to break stuff and whilst the russians are not doing as well as they really should be given the preponderance and numbers we're led to believe the reality is they are winning it's a slow process but they are winning 
you know, Mario Paul, I keep seeing in the, on the news here, <clears throat> oh, it's still resisting. No, one small complex or one large complex in a much larger town is resisting. So Russian forces have now, as you can see, bypassed it and are well away from it. They are moving towards the viable crossings across across the Dnieper River here at Dnieper and Zaporozhia. They're across into this area here. Mikoli, I was really interesting to them. There's another Slava class cruiser, the fourth one. It was never commissioned. It's tied up there at the shipyard it was built at. It's not completed. Almost. But it's up 90%, I believe, or 95%, something like that. We also aren't hearing much about this little sliver down here, Transnistria. There's some Russian troops there. So you probably wouldn't want to be in Odessa because you can bet the Russians will move all their bubbets down here and try and double envelop Odessa at some point. Mm. To me, this is only one winner in the medium term. And unfortunately, on the ground, that is the Russians. The last thing that NATO is going to do is get engaged in this by putting boots in the ground putting fighter aircraft over it and ships in the Black Sea. That would potentially cause World War III. None of us want that. That would just be silly. But the Ukrainians, understandably, are marrying terrain where they might well have been better to pull back, circle around an open door policy, if you like, a swinging door, and just flip right round and hit the Russians in the flank. And they might, just might, have liberated this entire area from Izium down to Luhansk, if they'd done that. It's possible they can't. We keep hearing that the Red Air Force, the Russian Air Force, is flying 140-odd missions a day. NATO flew, the coalition flew, I think it was 3,000 missions in day one yes, of yes. the ground campaign for Desert Storm with the same number of deployable aircraft, roughly, as the Russians have. There's a big difference in capability here. So, Jeffrey, what, where do you see this going? I mean, do you see them winning, the Ukrainians? The first thing that comes to mind right now um, is that, yes, the Russians in certain places do not have good training, but... Sometimes True. there's no better training than being in a war. Well, it's very Darwinian. Um, I am aware, I have, I have a, a Russian friend uh, and her family, uh, I won't name names, are actually split 50-50 between Russia and Ukraine, hmm. which is the worst of all possible worlds. And I know that a member of her family is now in Poland. They managed to get out of Kharkiv. Uh, the rest of her family are in Belgorod. Belgorod's within artillery range of Ukraine. And despite lots of claims from the Russians and from the Ukrainians, they aren't doing that. There have been explosions in Belgrade. There are artillery strikes going on. There have been rocket launcher hits using presumably the Ukrainian equivalent of Scud missiles. They don't have the more capable ones that the Russians have, I believe, but they do have the ability just to lob the odd explosive filled dustbin into these areas. I have no doubt they're doing it. Right. So this is already gone beyond a regional conflict. This is a, 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 an international conflict. The Ukrainians may not advance beyond their borders. But, you know, if I was their commander and I was trying to liberate Kharkov, I'd be wanting Belgorod. It's a jumping off point. Mm. I'd be wanting the rail node there. Because bear in mind that all these Eastern European militaries are totally rail bound, other than maybe the last 50 or 60 kilometres of their reach logistically they have 25 percent allowing for all the different weapon systems and so on in their formations of the logistical reach of an american unit that's really important and that goes some way to explaining why this thrust down to kiev fell apart because they just couldn't supply it no. they literally didn't have enough guys bringing you know beans benzene and, and bullets down to make that work they don't have that problem all the way around the area where there's heavy fighting going on, from what I understand, every day. So the training thing is Darwinian. People will be very good now in some of these Russian units. Guys who have been fighting for the last two months, mm -hmm. three months, they'll know what they're doing. Equally, there'll be a lot of Ukrainians know what they're doing. 
the, the thing is, is that I'm thinking about the airstrikes you were mentioning, because initially the Russians, I don't think the Russians really were doing that particularly well with their initial airstrikes. It wasn't coordinated enough. They weren't flying enough. Um, and the yeah. Ukrainians were clearly sustaining aerial assets for far longer than people were expecting. But now I'm getting the impression that if the Russians are flying more sorties, they've it's simply got to the point where they're starting to sort themselves out at all levels of command. The pilots are either skilled or dead. Yeah. So that means the Ukrainians are going to find it much, much harder to fly their own aerial missions to take out that artillery that will be slowly sure. grinding them. Yeah. One of the things as well is that NATO is providing, from what I've been led to believe, a whole bunch of electronic warfare and electronic support. In other words, raid warning from aircraft orbiting over Poland and over yep. Romania to the south and, and out over the Black Sea. Um, that is highly useful, but it does not take away the simple fact that you need to have aircraft in the air because mm. SAM systems can be taken out on the ground by guy or rifle. Yeah. And there's enough Ukrainians running about with uh, Kalashnikovs to make that quite a, a fair, you know, prospect that that a lot of the Russian forces up front probably don't have their air defence systems at full capacity, just because the guys taking pot shots at them. Mm. You know, um, I'm I'm going to stay away today from some of the issues that we're seeing around allegations of crimes against humanity and war crimes. Um, We'll save that for the next one. <laughs> we have some views in that as well, as I'm sure you can all imagine. So fix that map there in your mind. We're now going to go and take a little look at uh, bits and pieces uh, in um, Wikipedia, which, frankly, having released what is seen as arguably the best um, game, um, on World War II called Barbarossa. You can pick it up off our website in the link down below. Um, what we're actually going to do here is we're going to take a little look at the Eastern Front in World War II and, and try and come up and take a little look at what the differences are and see what actually went right, what went wrong. So it would be useful to set the scene. So the Battle of Kursk was fought just north of Kharkov. So Kharkov is in this area here. Belgorod, which is now part of Russia, is just here. And round at the top is Oro. So the German plan was blindingly obvious. Snip out this bulge, take some prisoners, demolish the Red Army's ability to launch a strategic offensive in 1943. So Operation Citadel, or Zitadel if you're German, involved three German armies, and as you can see, involved a very large number of Russian armies. And every one of those Russian armies had about nine divisions of, of troops, right? The 49th Army, I believe, in this Ukrainian conflict has about nine battalions. That's a single division attached. And they're all stripped out of different units and chucked in, predominantly with part train recruits. I'm not saying that these Soviet guys here were that much better. And in fact, the pretty poor performance in the South by the 1st Tank Army, the 5th Guards, uh, and, and the 5th Guards Tank Army, which chucked in. The whole lot got gutted. The Russians won in the north, they lost in the south. Von Manstein, who was the commander of that thrust there, was raging when he was told to call off by Hitler because he reckoned he'd won. And he was about to break out and, on his own, do the encirclement. That didn't happen. So, after that, failure, if you like, in the German part, the initiative then moved to the Russians. And this is a really useful little map, because all of a sudden, remember the one we're looking at before, we'll just bring it back up briefly. Right, you can see Luhansk, you can see Donetsk, you can see Volkanova over there. And uh, I think you'll find out that Luhansk is on this map. I'm loving your phone. <laughs> Which reminds me, mine will probably go off now. So Voroshilovgrad and so on. Voroshilovgrad, as I recall, and remember they keep changing their names, yeah, is probably Luhansk. So Izium is in this area here, right? So essentially, Rostov is here and Mariupol is there. 
this is exactly the same start point, is it not? And if you take a look at the different operations run by the, the, the Soviets, punching through on the northern bulge, driving in from the west to try and create a land bridge towards the Crimea, where they were already operating, guess what? That's pretty much the same thing. The Germans then counterattack in a limited fashion and push them back, and in fact do reasonably well when they do so. But they don't stabilise the front. They just don't have the manpower. Now, oddly, is that not what we've just seen the Ukrainians trying to do? Counterattack into the area, blah, 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 blah. Now, as that was all going on, the Russians launched a major offensive through Belgorod to Kharkov and beyond. Yeah. So the Germans actually pulled forces out of this area after the failure of the Kursk operation. They sent some to Italy to prop up the Axis forces in Italy, and they sent some down to the south to try and deal with the offensive that we've just discussed. That didn't go well. Let's just leave it at that. The Germans took a bit of a pasting. So, to be fair, did Russian units, but there's an awful lot more of them. And one does wonder if this operational pause in the north and the regrouping of forces we've heard about is something a little bit different. All right. We have to wonder if that is actually the reality is the Russians have just decided, right, let's pull back and do it again. They have a long habit of doing that. Um, historically. So finally, in September, so about four months, what, how many weeks are we now into uh, the Ukraine war? 60, 60 days. 60 days. So we're at two months just now. So after four months, and actually it took into the end of October for all these operations to come to an end, the Red Army actually blew through, took Mariupol, and smashed through Izium, smashed through the Panzer groups and drove on towards Romania. And you'll notice that Kharkov had a nice bulge around it, just as it does just now. So it does look like someone is finally, for the first time since all of this started, on the Russian side at least, taking a look at a history book and read a map. Something which I've been highly critical of both sides from doing, we're in Google Maps briefly uh, with Ukraine pulled up. You can see Kharkov here. You can see Belgrade there. You can see Oral up there. So the Kursk bulge was round that way. And then it goes more or less down exactly the same front line trace that we got just now. And the entire series of operations into this area should reasonably have just been a double envelopment either side of the bulge and then an exploitation towards the Dnipro. Any operation to create a land bridge out of Crimea, however, is just a waste of time. It's a total distraction. They didn't need it. What they needed to do is destroy the Ukrainian army in eastern Ukraine, which is where the bulk of their forces were when this all kicked off. They failed. But they are now doing it the hard way. Three guys dug in, and I'm willing to bet money that if we were to get in a plane, it couldn't be seen or a helicopter and go and have a look at that front line with their own eyes. This will look a bit like Verdun. Mm -hmm. Right, it'll look, it'll be a, a, it'll, or, or a passion deal. You know, it's not going to be good. So what, what are you thinking about all of this, Jeffrey? I'm, uh, I'd argue that the Ukrainian best, best option right now is to keep the front just as it is and try not to waste themselves too much in offensives. Because for some reason, for some bizarre reason, I'm thinking this almost like uh, Germans World War One or the Russians. They want they've got they, they want. Well, in many ways, the Germans were defensive for much of the First World War. But at the same time, the uh, the desire to advance forward into France and end the war was very much on their minds. Whereas the Ukrainians, it's definitely in their in their interest to the very least keep the front as it is. Because the Donbass, how much do they really want it? It's been a thorn in their side. Um, is it really worth it to expend more blood and treasure um, getting it back? But then on the other hand, do they want the Russians to nibble a bit of land? And then 20 years down the line, will Putin Mark II want to nibble another bit of land? What exactly 
is the best way to make the Russians never want to do this again? I think there has to be a combination of factors here. Uh, this video that I'm going to run just as we chat is, is something that Jeff found on Twitter. And it's an animation of what appears to have happened in the war so far. It's quite intriguing because an awful lot of what we've just been talking about, you can see it. You can see the thrust down towards Kiev. You can see the operation through Sumy and Konotop. Uh, you can see operations around Kharkov. Uh, and shortly we'll start seeing counterattacks up in the north. You can see that down in the south, things are moving to a certain point. They've grabbed their land bridge through uh, Melitopol. Mario Paul may or may not be hanging out there, but frankly, who really cares? That will go in due course. Now you can see the counteroffensive up in the north. <coughs> For Ukraine to get a lasting peace, every single bit there, and I think including Crimea, will have to be retaken. Hmm. I cannot see, given the whining about the Kerch uh, bridge not being adequate, to supply the Crimea. The Kerch Bridge is here uh, in the right hand side of Crimea. I have a horrible feeling that whether we like it or not, that is really what we're looking at. There has to be, and this is the Kerch Bridge that isn't acceptable here, right? We'll just use that in, in um, Google Maps, we can zoom in yourselves and have a look. We'll try and do that for you in the final video if you aren't already seeing it. But if you don't kick them right out and don't inflict massive casualties in the very best Russian units, and unfortunately put enough Russian kids in body bags, the Russian mothers and fathers, who currently, by the way, are quite supportive from what I am hearing mm. of Putin's special military operation. He's going to keep on doing this. And he's got the bodies to throw at it. There's 40 or 50 million, I think it is, Ukrainians. There's almost 200 million Russians. Right? And all of this, I'm sure, is it's a land grab. He's trying to get the 30% of the old Soviet military industrial complex that is in Ukraine back under Russian control. It's about mm -hmm. pushing... Uh, their border further west and away from Moscow. And it's exactly the same thing that happened in 1939 with the Winter War against Finland, driving the border away from this arc here, all the way up to here, just beyond what is, you know, Vyborg. All of that, none of this is really that surprising. I'm actually surprised that he hasn't suggested to the Poles that they retake Lvov as part of Poland and a partition. Now, I'm not saying that the Poles would go for it. In fact, I know for a fact they wouldn't. They're massively supportive of Ukraine because the Poles really hate the Russians. <laughs> they don't have much time for them at all. But to retake this whole area here, and it's a really big chunk of land, and bear in mind that a much better, more competent Red Army, albeit fighting an extremely competent German military, took four or five months to get to that line, which we're seeing all these different towns and so on showing up, but through Kiev and down through Krivoy Rog to Mikolaev, that took five months against a good opponent. But it was a good army fighting a good army. Might even be better seeing as a good army fighting a very good army, especially in the defensive. Mm -hmm. The Ukrainians are not as good as the Third Reich in my view. But if you were to put a number on it, they're probably a one. And the Russians might only be a 0.5. So for every 10 bubbas the Russians put in, they're only really fighting with five. Because he just ain't that good. But it's, it's a long drag. And to force Putin to accept that he got this wrong is going to take massive sanctions, much bigger than we have now, we're going to have to ban buying Russian oil. We're going to have to ban doing business with Russia as a whole. We're probably going to have to intern Russian pop the Russians who are in the West and vet them to find out if they're safe before we let them live here. Yada, yada, yada. We're going to have to make it really horrible to have a Russian passport. 
And at the same time, the Ukrainians are going to have to drive forward and retake all of that area, and probably including the, what is it, the, the, the new pro People's Republic and the Luhansk People's Republic or whatever the hell they set up as puppet regimes there. Hmm. And that's when you start to then ask other questions about whether or not Putin's going to escalate. And he mouthed off plenty about that at the beginning. Uh, we know that the French have had a chat with him. Those of you who don't know this, French military strategy during the Cold War when they withdrew from NATO's immediate control was simple. One Red Army soldier crossed the inter-German border and France would nuke Russia. That policy has not changed. So you can bet that all these discussions President Macron has had with Putin has been presaged by, look, dude, we're not that bothered by invading Ukraine. We're annoyed at it and we're going to sanction the hell out of you because we don't think that was necessary and we don't like it at all. But you put one body into NATO, we aren't going to muck about fighting you. There's no point. We'll just nuke you because it's going to go that way anyway. And on that really terrifying note, I think we'll leave this topic and we'll, we'll, we'll briefly say thank you very much for coming on board with us and having a, a, a listen. Please comment below. If we've got time, we, we will have a discussion with you. And if not, fair enough. We'll be back in the next week or so. In the next episode, we'll probably recap in some of this. And we'll talk a bit about the First World War game series that Jeffrey and I are working on, mostly Jeffrey, which is a 235 square mile to the hex uh, interpretation of the First World War. Um, the first couple of games, uh, which are Home by Christmas, dealing with the initial German offensive into France and then the stalemate that ensued into 1916, and then Armistice, which will take it from 1916 through to whichever side puts their hands up and says goodbye in the West, um, will come out in the next year or so. Uh, Jeffrey, at the moment, he is uh, shocking as all with his profound knowledge of three-pound guns and <laughs> World War I armoured cruisers. <coughs> Norman Friedman really needs to start working out whether he wants an embrasure to be separate in definition from a casemate or interchangeable. <laughs> That's there, why it's Campbell. There's, there's one page where he says... Um, Canopus's uh, 12 pounder guns are in embrasures. The next one he says casemates. And then for the London class, he says, these guns weren't in casemates, they were in embrasures. It, it, it's quite an interesting line of thought that I haven't thrown the book at the wall yet. Yet. So. Uh, well, I'm, I'm just about to test the one. The Canopus was one that fought at the Falklands, wasn't it? Yep. Yep. I've got a really nice picture here. Hold on a minute. Oh, just just if I can reshare it. Where's the share thing? Uh, share content. There we go. And it's back up. That's HMS Canopus. I can't see a thing. Can't you? No. Your 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 pictures. Oh, there we go. Oh, that's yep. That's Victorian colours. Yep. Uh, I think that's yep. That's pre refit. So her twelve pounders. I can just about see. Uh, oh, she's still got two six. Uh, sorry, two three pounders in her fighting tops. So that's roughly oh, 1903, I think. 1903 to 1905. He's, um, he knows his stuff, guys. He really does. <laughs> right. So here's my thought on this. And this is an official design decision going out in this video. That's an embrasure. That's clearly embrasures. Mm. I'll tell you what it is. It's just a room with a gun in it and a slot cut in the side of the hole with a gun barrel sticking through it. Yeah. That's why I had a look at this. Let's let's go and have a look at something a little bit more modern. Um we'll, we'll have a look at um Queen Elizabeth 1913. And I want uh it's too small. We need a better picture of her. Uh actually we might be better looking at Queen Elizabeth class battleships. Um her class, have we got a better picture? And the reason I want this, uh, you know, it's what we'd have it, pretty much every single one of them. Yeah, it's a terrible picture. That's her aft casemates, which were plated over. Mm -hmm. So a casemate essentially 
it's a little bit different. I wonder if we can find. Ah, has Revenge still got them? Yes. This might be worth looking at. This is HMS um, Royal Severn, I think it is. After major refit in 1944 or 5, about to go to Russia, by the way, on loan. And if you look, you've got A and B turrets with 15 inch. Then go down at the hull and just follow the hull line around. You'll see there's a couple of casemated guns. So a casemate is in a turret, which is armoured. Right, and the whole thing slides backwards and forwards. So if any of you can remember the tank that was in, was it Raiders of the Lost Ark? Yes. Oh, yeah, and the gun was in the, the pontoon in the back, on, on, the, on the box on the side of the tank. That's a case, mate. So there you go. Honestly, from a game rating perspective and a military usage perspective, neither are particularly good, I suspect. No. Far better with a gun turret. Mm. And, and and on that little note there, just to you know show you all that um stuff does actually occur in these videos that might impact on a game you can buy. Have mm. a look at that. Go away, sit and have a think about it. Um so you're aware of the games that we're going to be doing will be 10 or 15 maps. They'll start with at least four and a half thousand counters, and I'm notorious for putting more in a box than I should, so probably six give or take 1,000 playing counters. And you, yes, you did hear that right here. You heard it here first, guys. If you want to know more about what we do, please feel to drop us an email through the contact us in www.tkc-games.com. Um, and we'll be delighted to respond. Uh, even if you're a bit offended, we might even give you an answer. Um, because the whole point of these things is our opinion. We want to hear yours down below get into a polite conversation please anybody who's too rude will be deleted have a wonderful remainder of your weekend and a great week and uh let's just drop it there thank you for coming on board goodbye